Like I've had people in my life that have been in my, from what I would view as my close circles, 15 years who have never even acknowledged that I have a girl partner or that I've left a marriage, have never even brought up these conversations with me. Hello, I'm Mia Friedman and this is No Filter. What happens when the identity that made you famous isn't an identity that you want to wear anymore? Can you just ditch it? Will your followers let you? And will it destroy the business that you built on the back of that identity? More importantly, how do you tell your family that you're not following the script that everyone, including you, thought had been written for you? All right, let me back up for a second. This episode started with a phone call. Actually, an audio message. Mia, it's Sophie Keisha. I hope this worked because I'm driving, but I just want to let you know I just listened to your recent podcast with Lennon Doyle and... Oh my God. I first met Sophie when we were on a panel together with another entrepreneur, Zoe Foster Blake in Brisbane. Back then, Sophie was called the young mummy. And that's actually how she was introduced to me. Someone said, Mia, this is the young mummy. The young mummy was the name of the blog that Sophie had launched in 2013. And it was also the identity that she'd built for herself after she'd fallen in love with an AFL player. His name was Jared Keisha. And having her first baby with him when she was just 22. Young indeed. At first, she was famous because of who she was married to. But like Beck Jard and so many other smart and motivated entrepreneurial women, Sophie Keisha built a huge following of her own, independent of her footy playing husband. On the back of all her success, Sophie started a pyjama business called Keisha. And she rebranded herself from the young mummy to her name, Sophie Keisha. Uh, because it was, you know, her name after all. There were other changes in Sophie's life that came along as well. After the birth of her second baby, she began to question her sexuality, did some exploring, opened up her marriage, and ultimately she decided to separate from her husband amicably. And then, just like Glennon Doyle, Sophie fell hard for a soccer star. Soon after everyone went into lockdown, she revealed on Instagram that she was dating Matilda's player, Alana Kennedy. Or was she? There was a whole other drama that came after that, which we'll hear about in this interview. But that's how Sophie came to send me an audio message on her way from Melbourne to Sydney to spend time with her new partner after she'd been listening to Glennon Doyle share her story of falling in love with a woman and ending her marriage on No Filter a few weeks ago. So when we sat down face to face in the new Mamma Mia podcast studio, a few days after Soph left me that message, I started by asking her why the Glennon interview was so big for her. It wasn't so much so the the part about being in a relationship with a woman. Obviously, there's similarities there. We've both left marriages, we both have children, and we're both now in relationships with women. It wasn't so much that. It was the themes throughout the interview and throughout, you know, her writing. I read a lot of her writing where it's all about, you know, that whole tamed idea that women are brought up to feel like we should be grateful all the time and we should be content with what we've got. And if we have a man and if we have a beautiful ring and he has a job, like we should just be happy and we should be grateful because you know, that that man provided us with that life when that's obviously not always the case. Hashtag gratitude. Yeah. And, you know, why I I love the message that she pushes that why can't women seek for more? Why should we always have to settle? Not that settling because I had a beautiful, beautiful man in my life and I still do. He's an incredible father and an incredible friend to me. But why can't women seek more? That married life, I realized, wasn't what I wanted. And it it wasn't that I realized, oh, I like women now. I'm going to leave my marriage. It wasn't that. It was that I I did want more. As you say, the parallels are almost uncanny between you and Glennon in terms of she uh, is now married to a professional athlete who travel, who used to travel the world. It's funny because her and Alana do, I think they know each other. So it's really... Abby Wambach, yeah, her wife. It is. It's funny. Because yeah. Alana's a professional soccer player yes. as well. How did you guys meet? Through work. So uh, we share the same management company, but still we our relationship blossomed on, on the phone, on FaceTime. She was overseas for probably the first five to six months and um, not that we dove straight into a relationship at all. It absolutely wasn't like that, but we definitely connected straight away. And in a way she changed my life in the sense that she, because obviously I, I 
dated women and, and, and men and, you know, I was going through, I, I was a single, you know, it was a single period for me, but she was the person that made me realise, wow, I can actually see myself in a relationship with a woman long term and I can see myself having a life there. So You say, obviously, I dated women and I dated men. Mm. Isn't it funny how that has become part of the, you know, uh, not the zeitgeist, but that's almost background noise now. It's it's yeah. entirely unremarkable, the fact that you could be married to a man and then date women and date men. But have you, before you got married, did you also date women? No, never. Um, looking back, again, I go back to that conditioning, mm. that environment that I grew up in, those values, not, uh, not at all that my parents were, you know, you couldn't do that. But I suppose the school I went to, the friends I hung around, I wasn't exposed to things like that. Um, that sounds very naive how I worded that. I didn't mean that. I, I wasn't exposed to with the friendship circles that I surround myself with, I suppose. So it was very, um, you know, this is what you did. You go to uni, you do this, you get your degree, you find a man and every girl's chasing a rock on her finger and we get it and we're happy and, and that's so great. Me, I just want to challenge all those, um, you know, the, I want to challenge the norm and I want to, I want to find what else is out there. I want to experience, I want to experience life. That's a big thing for me. And again, going back to what Glennon says, it's not always about settling, but, you know, it's it's abandoning what we think or we're told we should be. And that's what I've done. I've thrown that out the window. I loved what she says about being overwhelmed and underwhelmed yep, at the same time. Absolutely. That to me sounds like what you're describing, yep. this idea of, yep. is this all there is? Yep. And is it enough? Yeah. And it's again, it's nothing personal against my ex-partner incredible person and everyone in my circle, my close circle, my family will vouch for that. But it's overwhelmed to the point of, you know, this is my life. And at times I felt like I, you know, have I made bad decisions here? Should we have got married? Um, I don't regret my children at all, but they obviously impacted my 20s. My whole 20s was being a mum. My rest of my life will be a mum, but my 20s was changing nappies and, you know, sleepless nights. And now I go into my 30s in a position where I've got older children. Um, How old are they now? Bobby's six and Florence has just turned three. So I love how that's your definition of older. Yeah, but, but what you mean is you're babies. out of the baby I'm out stage. of nappies. I think once I'm out, you're yeah. out of nappies, you feel a bit more freedom yeah. come to you, you know. And I felt a bit more like Sophie, to be honest, and... I don't think it's bizarre that a woman in her late 20s really started to find herself. I think that's actually quite normal and I think that that's okay. I just think for me I was married with kids so it's like, well, no, you should already know who you are. You should not be doing that. Um, so I do think it, it made a lot of people um, uncomfortable to see me doing that. But who, made, who was uncomfortable? I just I, I was recently telling Lance, like I've had people in my life that have been in my, from what I would view as my close circles, 15 years who have never even acknowledged that I have a girl partner or that I've left a marriage, have never even brought up these conversations with me. Now, I would think if, you know, a family member or a friend, a cousin, et cetera, um, had gone through these things. What should they say? It's not what they... If anyone's in that situation. Yeah. Um, maybe just check in. Maybe just... I don't know. It's not that I need people to, but also in return, I've recently spoken to a friend about this where I said I do know, because I did, I pulled away from a lot of people. I probably have still pulled away quite a bit because there was such a period of my life there where I was so uncertain. I didn't have answers. So I was almost embarrassed to talk to people about it because I didn't know what I was going to say. So I get it that their view is probably she doesn't want to talk about it. So I think it comes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I absolutely don't point the finger at people. I say that there's just... For me, I probably should have reached out to a few more people. Because you feel like your life has changed so fundamentally mm. and how can people not acknowledge this and yeah. still claim to be close to me? Yeah, but then on the other hand, I absolutely get that they're probably like, oh, she's dealing with something really personal. If mm. she wants to talk about it, she will. So I, I definitely see both sides. You came out in a couple of different ways and it's even sort of funny having to say that, but first you did an interview where you said, you know, people are saying Are you a lesbian now. Mm. And I, hang on, I want to read what you said because it was really interesting. I think I said, uh, am I sitting here saying I'm a lesbian? No. Am I sitting here saying I'm not a lesbian? No. Yeah. Yeah. And 
then at the end of March, you made it Insta official, Mm -hmm. which is the only official that counts. Yeah. And you posted a picture of you and Lana and you said, everything and everyone has a place and time. It's been a long and bumpy road for us to get here, but I'm glad to be in isolation and running out of toilet paper with you. (laughs) (laughs) What were those different stages and decisions like? Because, you know, when you're you have a, a, a partner or former partner and you've got children mm. and then your former partner's family. Yep. What's the, the calculation in your mind before as a public figure you make those declarations? So for me it was just, like I said, going back to figuring a lot of things out before I spoke to anybody. So it's funny with social media, I had a lot of followers, you know, asking questions and I, th- I th- would think I haven't even spoke to my mum about that. I'm not going to post it on Instagram. What questions yet. are they asking? Oh, you know, are you gay? Are you in a relationship with a woman? I, well, first of all, it started with have you and Jared separated? Mm. We hadn't told our families for 12 months that we were planning to separate. Um, you know, are you, I saw you here or I, you know. So this is before you mentioned oh, it in the this interview. Is long before. So there was lots of questions that would come in Um like I said, about really personal things mm. from just followers observing that we hadn't even spoken to anybody about. Because you'd been so, seen out in public and the, yeah. the jungle drum started yeah, beating and the and, gossip. And I get that. That's fine. But I think the whole, and also too, because I had been previously so open with every facet of my life, every little intricate detail. And I had a partner at the time who was okay with me doing that. And then when you're going through changes that are so emotionally, mentally Like I was going through such a battle, so much turmoil. What is happening with my life? First of all, what's happening with me? What's happening with my marriage? What's happening with my life? What's this going to mean for my kids? And then to feel like I have to explain that to to Instagram followers, it's like it was suffocating, you know. Mm. Um, So that post that you just read out um, regarding, you know, Instagram official, a lot of that background noise wasn't anything really to do with Alana. It was my own personal things to get me to that point. Like that was a very big deal for me to, you know, I don't think that's me going, hey, I'm gay because I probably don't still sit here and go, I am a lesbian. I sit here and say I have a partner who's a female. So It's a funny thing, the desire to put people in boxes. Yeah. Like everyone, have you found that? People wanting you to say what you are? Yeah, well, it's funny. I, I do laugh at this stuff. I've started a TikTok account, which, you know, I started with my son to do silly dances and now I do the occasional one. I look like an idiot, but that's fine. I think we all do. Yeah, that's fine. I've got I'm too. happy to do that. <laughs> um, and someone, I didn't even realise, I, I really don't check the comments or something. And, and a mum of three kids had written, written on there, are you a lesbian? And I just hadn't answered. And then I think she wrote something like, can you just answer yes or no? It's very simple. (laughs) Just, just be honest. (laughs) And I thought, well, one, it's not actually very simple. (laughs) Two, Stephanie 9092 or whatever your name was. I don't actually have to answer you. And thirdly, (laughs) just be honest. I've, I've shared my partner on my page because I haven't put a banner above it saying, hey, <laughs> this is my gay girlfriend and me. I think it's quite self-explanatory, Can really. You please use a hashtag. Yeah. Like what hashtag are you using, Sophie? Uh, I need to use. Is it uh, queer? So, is it lesbian? Yeah. What is it? The people need to know. Rainbow. I'll just put a rainbow. No, but the, it's it's funny because, yeah, she, she it's yes or no, just be honest. And I think um, something that I've found too is, because I have evolved over the years, when I started this whole Instagram, I was 22, 23 years old. I'm now turning 30 this year. I've gone through a lot in my private life. My mind has matured. Um, you know, my thoughts have matured and I have evolved as a person and, and that's what we all do. You know, if I asked you if you were the same person eight to ten years ago, I'd hope that you'd say... Babe, I'm a different person than before <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> I'm going to be a different person in about eight minutes. I'm on TikTok coffee. now. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> So I think, again, people sometimes struggle with, well, you used to share everything. Why aren't you sharing everything? There's so many factors that come into it now. One, I'm a different person. I'm absolutely a different person and I'm really proud of the person I've blossomed into. Two, I have an older son now who's at school. I'm now cautious of what he hears, what their mums are watching on Instagram. They might tell their son and, and he listen, He listens to so much. He hears conversations that go on in my house. So I'm now cautious of him and my daughter. Um, thirdly, the person I am in a relationship with comes from a totally different world. She's a professional athlete. Social media isn't her norm and I need to respect her privacy, her family's privacy. And if anything, she's taught me in a way, I think because I have been on this platform for so long in such an open, raw way, 
And I did start to see the beauty in privacy and if anything, she's like stamped that into me that it's so nice to live in our own little bubble and we did. Like I'm telling you now, no, it's, it's funny, people on Instagram, especially the trolls, they think they know everything about your life. They, no one knew about her for a very, very, very long time and it was so, so beautiful and we say our favourite moments are together when it's just us and no mm. one knows what's going on. It's so nice. You you started, as you said, blogging under the the name The Young Mummy. And I've heard this from a lot of people who came of age as bloggers and and then moved on to other things. Your audience almost feels entitled Mm -hmm. to every to knowing everything about you. And and it's kind of always reminded me of the idea that just because you've had sex with someone once doesn't mean that they're entitled to have sex with you Mm -hmm. whenever they want. Like you get to draw the the boundaries. Mm Don't you? You get to say, well, I told you everything about that relationship or at that time of my life and now I don't want to do that anymore. Yep. How have you found navigating that transition? I think for me I, I'm okay because I that comes naturally to me that, you know, I'll stamp my authority and I'll put my foot down and I will say no, but I do feel for the people who aren't that strong that are in that space. Um, Did you worry that it was going to cost you in terms of business profile yeah, and, opportunities and for a bit it probably did and I was okay with that and um you know I was with a previous management company who I remember said to me well if you're not blogging you've got to be doing something you know if you're not a blogger now what are you going to do and I thought I'm okay to just sit for a while and figure it out you know I'm okay if I become irrelevant for a while that's totally fine with me while I figure some stuff out I'm so fine to just sit in the shadows it, it doesn't seem like it, but whilst I am on social, I'm very present, my businesses are on there, I don't actually live and breathe social media like a lot of people in my space do. I probably did a few years ago. Mm. Now, you know, something like I didn't post a photo for five days, like the old Sophie would have been fretting and sweating, you know, I've got to keep in people's feeds. Mm. now. Feeding the beast. Yeah, but now it's um, I obviously – understand the power in it. And I have a uh, business in Keisha that is extremely successful off the back of social media. So I'm not naive to that. And I'm forever grateful for the fans, the followers and the loyal customer base that we have produced from that. Keisha doesn't exist without it. Um, so absolutely, I, I'm staying in the space for these for these opportunities. But um, I, I definitely don't live and breathe it. And it doesn't, you know, take over my mind so much like it used to. Is it awkward having the same name as your ex-husband when it's your brand and you're not married anymore? No, not really. And a lot of um, questions have come in to me um, on social about will I change my name back? Now, that's something when I separated, I didn't go, no, am I going to change my name back? What am I going to do? Because I've got Keisha as a business, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, if I do choose to change my name back, Keisha's still my family name. It's still my children's name. So that, you know, and, and Jared's never going to say, excuse me, get my name off the wall. Um it's that's a brand mm. name now. So that doesn't really phase me. If anything, at the start, I was like, no, I'll never change my name. And then I've thought, well, I might one day if I, I do meet another partner and I'm obviously in no way, shape or form even thinking about getting married again. I'm still actually married. Um, <laughs> one, one, one marriage at yeah, a time. Can we just do one thing, please? <laughs> I can't concentrate. Um, you know, will I return to my maiden name? Yeah, maybe one day if I do want to remarry, um, will I change my name again? Absolutely not. Um, changing my name is something that even Jared said at the time. He's like, why are you doing that? You're such like a feminist inside. Why are you taking my name? But I desperately wanted the same name as my kids. Um, mm. But now I've realised it's not really relevant. They're my kids. They're my blood. They're not going yeah. anywhere. <laughs> so, um, no, it doesn't, seeing that name, you know, Keisha on the walls, I go into my office. That's something I'll be proud of forever. It was a point in my life where I, you know, I named my first company after my family's name and how beautiful I just mm. think mindset is everything. You can mindset has your mindset has the power to control everything. Could I look at that and go, oh, that's so sad. That was my married name, and now I was separated. Sure. Could I look at it and say, me and my partner started this business, and and we had two beautiful babies, and now their name lives on the wall forever. Yeah. A couple of weeks after you posted that image of you and Alana, you posted a sort of emotional post about being heartbroken. It seemed very raw and not in keeping with what we'd just been Mm. talking about, about keeping some things back. Um, I went before this interview because I'd remembered reading Mm. it at the time and I went back to look for it. It's not there anymore. It's still on my Instagram TV but it's off my feed. Okay. Which I've only recently realised you can do that. I did not know I'm not very savvy. We've learnt things you and I today. Someone who's on social media, I'm not very savvy. 
Uh, what was that about? Do you feel comfortable yep. saying? Yeah, no, I do. Um, I'll probably get a bit emotional talking about it, but that a lot of people viewed that as, oh, her and Alana have broken up and, you know, she's made a crying video. It, about, what I yeah. thought. And obviously our relationship at that point had hit a hiccup and, like I said, it, there's been times um, throughout the past, you know, coming up 12 months it hasn't been easy juggling so many different factors in our relationship. But that to me was... I will definitely get emotional about it. That to me, the thing with Alana was the tip of the iceberg and underneath all of that was the past two years of my life that I had not dealt with. Um, Sorry. And I think that was me almost crying out for help to people that I hadn't spoken to. Now, doing that via social media, I'm sure some people look at that and think, why the hell would you do that for? But that was me crying out to my family. That was me crying out to my friends. That was me crying out to social media that whilst I looked like I had had it all together and I looked like I'd separated from my husband and it was fine and we've got such a good relationship, that's all true. doesn't mean that any of it's been easy. Mm. Um, It doesn't mean that any of the, you know, inner turmoil that I have battled for so long inside my head, whether that's with my marriage, what I'm going to do to my children's lives, my sexuality, um, it doesn't mean that battling any of that inside my head was easy and that was me. Um, You know, those videos weren't recorded over that week that I disappeared off Instagram. They were recorded for for ages and it wasn't something I planned and I'm going to put together this. That's like of your son comforting you while you were crying and stuff. That was videos over months of time of me. Um, And I think I, I mentioned it before, I've almost been too, not embarrassed, but too ashamed to talk to people because I have always been I've always been Sophie who's had it together and, again, we go back to grateful, like be grateful that, you know, you and your husband get along so well after you've split up. It's so nice. Doesn't mean it's easy, no, because I live with every day, every single day I think of my children and whilst, again, I cannot be more grateful for the relationship I have with their dad. You know, he even stayed over last week because Bobby wanted him to stay over it doesn't mean it's easy because, Mm -hmm. you know, when I've got the kids and and Florence is saying, where's my daddy? I want to sleep with dad. Or when they're going to Jared's house and Bobby's clinging to me saying, I don't want to go. Um, These are the things that we deal with, with children. So Jared and I are fine, but it's the things with the children that are so, um, such a battle every single day and just little conversations of is daddy going to be coming here or can we do this with dad? And, and again, we're so flexible. We're so fluid with when who's having the kids and whatever, but it's I live with, heartbreak. I live with that guilt every day that I've let yeah. my kids down and that I don't know what my life looks like right now. So I don't know what their life looks like. And I know as a team, we will work so hard together and we do every day to give them the best life, but it doesn't mean that as a mum I don't feel that guilt. And that's because we're conditioned as mothers to feel that if our children experience any pain, yep. we're somehow failing Again, them. And also no Glennon. mother, <laughs> Glennon, no mother wants their child to feel any pain. No. It's not what we want. But again, a theme um, that Glennon spoke about in your podcast, but one I spoke about to a a counsellor I saw probably two years ago. She said, would, uh, I'm going to quote this wrong, but it was something along the lines of, oh, my nose is running everywhere. I'm going to look so sexy. Um, You know, do you want to bring your kids up and, and, you know, abandon yourself in the process and and they're happy and it's all smooth and it's all wonderful? Or do you want to teach your kids a little bit of heartbreak and show them that life isn't always easy and in turn you're going to be the best person you can be? And so I've gone with that and taught them that don't be afraid to step outside of the norm, you know. Don't abandon yourself in the process, in in the process of making anyone else Mm. happy in life and I hope, you know, that's that's how I sleep at night, that I just hope my kids can look and say, Mum, I'm so proud of you and Dad, I'm so proud of you as well because you made the best of a really shitty situation and no one settled and no one lived an unhappy life and I want them to know that they can do that too and they can chase and they can go in any direction they want to go in if it means that they're chasing their happiness and they're chasing fulfilment somewhere. I'm going to flip the switch entirely. <laughs> And this is not about 
Alana or anyone in speci- in particular. Yep. But you've always been fairly open about sex mm-hmm. and I wanted to ask you what the difference is between sex with a woman and sex with a man generally, not about anyone in yeah, specific. Yeah, 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 no. <laughs> She'll be turning out, <laughs> she'll be sitting no. out there rolling over. No. I don't mean anyone specific but no, I mean generally. Okay, let's generally. go back to the first time that I had a sexual encounter with a woman then. Immediately it's... um. And this is going from sex with my husband, who I loved and adored, but for me sex with a woman is on an incredibly more intimate and emotional level, the connection between two women. And it's a connection that um, you could feel across a table. Now, with a man, I feel like you might feel a sexual chemistry with a man across the table and, and that's instant and you can go, yes, we are, like there is a vibe there. With a woman, it's as simple as a look into each other's eyes. And it's it's almost like you could fall in love with them instantly, which most women do very quickly. Um. Yeah, I was going to say that because I tried to say this to Glennon, you know, when she was talking about Abby. I can't believe that they, from that moment of meeting, I know. instantly. And, like, and it was like, but I often just hit it off with women, right? Mm-hmm. Like all the time. And like you can have chemistry and you can yep. flirt and you can have great banter and yep. you can go out. But how do you know the difference between that and like a tingly feeling in your pants. Okay, well, I'll go. Or is that the actual way? Is no, that the I'll actual way? I'll go back to my moment and it goes back to, and this is something I've never spoken about ever. The first moment that I had with a woman, um, I'd just given birth to Florence. Oh. Okay, I've just given birth to Florence and I had to do a talk um, for the AFLW maybe three or four weeks later. And I had, you know, boobs out here and I had belly and I, you know, I had stitches in my fanny probably still, like everything going on. Mm. So I didn't feel sexy, didn't feel anything, but I had to go talk on a panel. And I, you know, doled myself up and whatever and fed the baby and left her at home. And and I go back to what you asked before, had I ever had sexual encounters or thoughts about women prior no. Looking back, probably a few things made sense, but I never was like, oh, I want to kiss that girl. Not through high school, never. Um, and then I, I rushed into this room and, you know, typical ma- new mum, I was a bit late and I've rushed in, I'm shaking hands, hello, hello, hello. And I shook this woman's hand and it was like, I hear of these moments. I had my moment. I had my moment. It was just like, ah. <laughs> Quiet angel and singing. It wasn't a tingle in the pants or anything like that. It was a like rush of emotion and feeling and connection, like yeah. a, electricity. When you sh- I shook her hand and I just went, "Oh my god, who are you?" And I found myself during the talk. She was sitting next to me, and I found myself looking at her hands, going, "Oh my god, her hands are so amazing." And I was like, "What the fuck? Like, what are you doing?" And then I was like, as you talk, I was looking at her and. Uh, and I just found myself besotted by this woman. Mm. And I went straight home to Jared. I said, oh, my God, Jared, I think I just fell in love with a woman. And when he's like, what? <laughs> and I was like, no, you know how people talk about those moments and et cetera. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, I just had it. And I- So you guys obviously had a very open relationship oh, that you could say that. Absolutely. And he wasn't threatened. No, no, absolutely. And he ended up being friends with this girl for a very long time. We'd go for coffee and, and whatever. But she was just the first woman that actually... It wasn't like, oh, I think she's so hot, I want to sleep with her. It was just an instant mm. chemistry. And how did you take that? What did you do next? Uh, so, oh, that was probably, if, oh, that would have been, well, Florence is three. Yes, I, was, oh, I can't believe that that was three weeks after I had Florence. And then, um, you know, Jared and I, after we had Florence, we started to sort of navigate a few things. Is this, you know, which direction do we want to go in, et cetera, et cetera. And we both experimented with other people during that time. We had, you know, we've had a very, you know, not open relationship at all the whole time, but we've been very, you know, fluid, I suppose. Mm. Pretty okay with a lot of things. And it sounds like it was very mutual. Absolutely. Because sometimes you hear about these so-called open relationships where it's really just one person wanting to have sex with other people and the other person doesn't want Both sides, um, we're very similar in that um lots of things were just okay Hall passes with, yeah lots of things yeah. were okay and lots you know if that's what you want to do that's fine so did you end up having a relationship with this woman uh not a relationship no yeah. <sighs> but a sexual encounter yes yeah but uh, quite a while afterwards yeah quite a while afterwards yeah is it better mm, yes <laughs> <laughs> to put it bluntly <laughs> yes why it's that again it's that chemistry mm. it's that connection it's you know what women are like. We 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 
pay more attention to detail. Mm. We care that little bit more about feelings and what can I do to make you feel better about yourself. And I suppose with a woman too, even though, you know, I was married to Jared who made me feel like the most incredible person in the world, but as a woman with your body and the, you know, every little part of it, if it's another woman, you feel totally fine. I was going to ask about that. How does body image come into it? Yeah, I think you it's not even, you don't even give it a thought. Yeah. It's just that's you and this is me. Whether I feel, well, I remember being, you know, a young teenager with boys, I'd be like, oh, don't look here, don't look at that. Oh, does mine look different to yeah. someone oh, else? I've got my period. Or, or, yeah, oh. like, oh, I didn't shave enough or blah, blah, <laughs> blah. But with a woman it's just like, oh, that's it. It's just it's not really spoken about. You feel you are made to feel, well, in the very, here's me, like queen lesbian of the world, in the very few sexual encounters I've had with a woman. On behalf of lesbians, I'd just of like the to entire say. <laughs> community, <laughs> no, personally speaking, and I haven't had very many sexual encounters with women, um, but the ones that I have, I've been made to feel amazing. I'm so happy to see you so happy. It was lovely to Thank meet you. Alana. Thank you. Um, yeah, she'd be hiding out there, rolling around, going, what has she said about me? She seems not like the limelight type. No, and that's the thing. It's been great because, like I said, everyone's like, oh, you've pulled back. Well, you need to look at, at the factors that play at that, and it's not just me. It's not my life now that's impacted. Like I said, it goes to my children. Their life is impacted. You know, Jared's family as well have had to navigate through this whole process and now I've got a new partner mm. who, again, comes from a completely different world. She's a professional in her own right and I respect that and I'm a professional in mine. We live two very different lives. We're both very respectful of that but together we make a really good team. That was Sophie Keisha, businesswoman, mother and woman. And what I found most interesting about that conversation, among all the things, was that point at which all those things intersect and you could really hear the emotion in her voice and it made me cry too when she was talking about that conflict she feels between being a woman and pursuing things like her sexuality and her decision to end her marriage and embark upon a new relationship and what that means to her children and her identity as a mother and where it all kind of intersects. And that is such a crucial point for so many women who have had children, which is why we have created a whole podcast about motherhood and identity. It's called Me After You, and it's hosted actually by another female entrepreneur in the public eye, uh, Laura Byrne. She was on The Bachelor, but before that, she has a jewellery line of her own, and she became a mother about a year ago. And in this podcast, she interviews all kinds of women from all different backgrounds at all different stages of motherhood about how they found their identity and how they resolved, I guess, those often conflicting feelings between being a mother and being a woman. Issues of sexuality and career, friendship and relationships. It is the most fantastic podcast. We'll put a link in our show notes, but you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. It's called Me After You, and we've worked really hard on it at Mamma Mia. Until next week, I'm Mia Friedman, and lots of love. <laughs> <laughs>